Good morning. I really say welcome to each and every one of you. We're thankful that we're able to gather together in church this morning and, and uh, be with Pastor Ellen as he shares the message. And we ask that you'll be with Life Light, those people that are there. Keep them so they aren't overheated with it. And we're thankful for our conditioning here. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, that was my fault. I didn't have my pack turned on. I'm going to try again. <laughs> this morning 
is from Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 21. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Raging at my feet, I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can see every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. Same power that rose Jesus from the grave. Same power that commands the dead to wake lives in. Good morning. 
It's always wonderful to gather in the house of the Lord for worship. Uh, welcome to those joining us online and those visiting today. Uh, let's take a moment and greet one another as the family of God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful, grateful for this reminder as we sing that the same power that you have been at work in this world, that your same Holy Spirit that we read about in Scripture, that we, we celebrate is at work in us. And that even as we gather this day, we know that we don't do this alone. It's not just the people in this room, but you are present through your Spirit. Thank you, O oh Lord, for being here. And we ask that, that your presence would help us, would guide us, would lead us, empower us to be faithful to you, both in our worship and how we worship you each day of our lives by living out our faith. And so, Lord, we come now in celebration of what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do in our lives. For our trust is in you. You keep your promise. You rose Jesus from the grave. You give us hope of a bright tomorrow. Not just a hope for this life, but in the life to come. You have been so good to us. Let us lift up our praises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just have one announcement this morning. A reminder that the steak fry is on Saturday. And from what I've been understanding, talking with the deacons, is, is a lot of people that have been talking about going have it turned in their RSVPs. And you can still come if you don't fill out that RSVP, but it's helpful. It's really helpful because they need to know how many stakes they have. And so Beth's going to come share a little bit more because she's got all the good information that you want to know about this steak fry. We'll give her mic one. All right. Um, just as Alan said, it's Saturday, and it's um, come and go. So it's we start serving at 5.30, but you don't have to be there at 5.30. If you can't make it till quarter to seven, we'll still have steak for you. Okay? So keep that in mind. However, we do have Cindy Anderson coming. Um, she's going to play for us all evening. So she will be playing from 5.30 to 7, so that'll be enjoyable. So just come and listen to her, if nothing else. Um, and then our offering that we're going to be taking, it's a free will offering. I don't know if you have noticed, but the parking lot that is original to the church um, is starting to crumble, and we're replacing a section of that, and that's what our offering will go towards. So um, again, please put your reservations in today. Our numbers are not where I had kind of expected them. Um, so if you would, please um, give us your reservations so that we make sure we have enough stakes for everybody. Uh, Troy at W2s is cutting them up for us this week, so. Thank you, Beth. If you are looking to fill out a, uh, a sign-up form, they are on the Welcome Center, and then you can just leave them in the basket where the mints are, because the mints are probably going to be gone by then. Uh, usually we go through whatever number we put out, so just go ahead and put it in the basket on the Welcome Center, and the deacons will collect them after service, and it's just a matter of knowing how many steaks to order. We want to make sure there's enough for that celebration, that time together. Um, at this point in service, we're going to release our, our little ones to go and have their time of worship. Before they leave, let's, let's take a moment to pray over their time and our time together. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for each of these children as they prepare to go to children's church, as they have their time of lesson and prayer and discussion. I ask that your spirit would be with them. Help prompt them to good questions. Help them to remember and recall these answers to the questions they have as they grow in faith. May this be a helpful part of their development as followers of you. And Lord, be with us as we turn to your word. Give us wisdom on how to understand what you have put forth in your word. Help us to, to take to heart these things that you have said, especially on this topic that, that many of us 
maybe want to develop more, this idea of sharing our faith. Give us a willingness to hear what you have said and to live this out in our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this opportunity. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so all our little ones, three years old all the way through fifth grade, you are released through the back corner there for Children's Church. As we who remain uh, prepare for this morning's time in the Word and this morning's message, I do want to point out that there are notes in your bulletin if you choose to follow along. We are continuing our series, Go and Tell. In this series, we've been talking about uh, various topics that have to do with evangelism and discipleship. And particularly in this section of this series, uh, we are focusing on four questions that stop us, that are the four questions that were recognized on what stops people from sharing their faith. Last Sunday, we approached the first of these questions is, what do I say? And what we found through that in studying the the encounter of Jesus with the woman at the well is that an effective outreach tool is to just tell your simple, clear story. Include in it three parts. Uh, Your life before Christ, how you met Christ and came to faith, and what Jesus is doing in your life since. And even then, even when you know what you're going to say, we still have a question that remains. We still have this week's question, which is, who do I say it to? You have a story. You have your walk with Jesus to share, but who do we tell it to? Who do we share with? Now, the tempting answer, I think, that comes to mind is everyone, of course. We need everyone to hear our walk of faith. And while there is a correct answer in this, that we collectively as believers want to reach everyone with the gospel, we also recognize at the same time that this goal of everyone is too broad of a scope for one person. It's too broad of a scope for one congregation or one town or one ministry to be able to reach. And when we set impossible goals for ourselves, human nature kicks in at times. And human nature is when something seems too hard, we get that defeated mentality, which can mean giving up or not even trying or, or maybe trying a little but not giving our all. And that can be problematic in something as serious as sharing our faith. And that's why it's so important that we have this time in prayer, praying for someone by name to be saved, that we have someone in mind. Because then instead of being intimidated by the mission of reaching reaching out to everyone as the entire body of Christ, we can focus on what each of our individual contributions might look like. And not being afraid then to start small. And as you think about who it is that that you might be being called to share your faith with, consider first your closest relationships, your family, your friends. And that's why if you are following along in your notes this morning, our first point is that evangelism is relational. Evangelism is relational. We're not going to start with some stranger living a thousand miles away that we have no access to, right? Who are we going to share our faith with? It's people that we are already having relationships with, that we already have a connection with. There's already an amount of trust that has been built. For the truth is that the gospel spreads most readily, most often, on a personal level. And while there are some wonderful evangelistic ministry doing God's work, that there are ministries that are going out to far reaches of the world, there's ministries gathering people together for events. Uh, We think of like Rise Fest and Life Light, that they bring people in and it gives them an opportunity, a stage to share And these are wonderful tools for evangelism. And when you think of the rallies like what Billy Graham was famous for, the truth is that most evangelism happens not on a grand scale, but on a personal 
level. When people sit down with someone they trust and have a serious conversation. For, because that trust, that familiarity, it matters. When we approach a topic as serious and as life-changing as the good news of Jesus Christ. What this also means is that your story is not something that you're likely to end up sharing in front of a large crowd of people. That's not what God necessarily has for everybody. Instead, the most likely way that you are to share your faith for most people is in a less formal setting. Not a speech, but as part of a conversation. Sitting down one-on-one -on -one with someone you care about, someone you know, someone that you've built trust with. Maybe a close family member or friend. In this conversation then, it happens. And it doesn't happen necessarily at the time of our choosing. It's when the right opportunity arrives. Maybe a question is asked and there's an interest. It's something we don't force. Instead, it may be a matter of waiting and praying for days, weeks, years. Because our timing is not God's timing. But we continue to pray. We continue to trust the work of the Holy Spirit. And what this can really highlight for us is that importance in narrowing that focus. For whom is God calling you to seek to have that conversation? Of course, we're, we're not going to turn down the perfect opportunity with the stranger that we come across that's willing to listen and the prompting and the work of the Spirit is there. However, such an opportunity is much more likely to come as the result of a sense of, or a level of intentionality. And by intentionally praying and seeking opportunity, you might better notice when that conversational door is opened. In some ways, it can be better to think small. For whom is God calling you to seek and have this conversation? Because, of course, if, if God were to offer up the perfect opportunity with a stranger, of course, we're going to follow through. But what we see in the next point in your notes this morning, if we're going to jump to our second point, which is that we start with family and friends. Or we start with friends and family. That we start with those that are closest to us. We see this in the story from the Gospel of Matthew. If you're following along with us this morning, I invite you to open up Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be starting with verse number 9. We read here, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. What we find in this passage, one that you might be very familiar with already, is Jesus calling a man named Matthew, a tax collector, to be one of his disciples. And yes, you might already notice that we are in the gospel of Matthew reading about this event. That this Matthew mentioned in this passage is the same Matthew with whom we, are, we understand is to have written this gospel. And what this means for us is we are reading his first-hand personal account of when he was called by Jesus to follow him. And so at, this, at the time of this encounter, we find Matthew doing his job. He is sitting at a tax booth. He was collecting taxes, most likely in the form of taking a toll on goods, and or goods that were being transported into that area. And while Matthew is sitting there working at his tack booth and taking those tolls, Jesus comes up and he calls him to be a disciple. And like others who had come before him, the others that Jesus had called, Matthew immediately leaves his place of work. And he goes and he follows Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of a shocking idea, especially if you think about it through the lens of what life looks for us today. To move on in a moment's instance from your stable source of income. 
However, Matthew does not hesitate. He recognizes the unique offer that was laid before him. And how could he not? There were plenty of, of other jobs available, but there is only one Jesus. And so what does Matthew do? He immediately rises and he follows him. Now this is a passage that, that we've heard before. It's, it's very commonly referred to this calling of the disciple. There's a good message there about being willing to leave things of this life behind in order to pursue Christ. But I think unfortunately this is a lot of time when we reference different passages, this is where we stop. And that's really too bad. Because there is more to this story. It's more than just Matthew becoming a disciple. It's more than this life changing decision he makes. It's what he does in response to this calling that matters so much in this grand scheme of things and really shows us a bit of this importance and how to go about sharing our faith. And so as we look at verse 10, as we continue reading, it says, And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Some time had passed be between verses 9 and 10. Matthew is known for that in his writing. He's not writing a diary of daily activities. He is telling us of a significant event, and then he's telling us of the next significant event. And so in this case, one significant event was Jesus calling him to follow him. And then the next, in his recollection is this gathering that he's talking about where Jesus was going to go over to Matthew's house and what appears to be a gathering or a reception in Jesus' honor. But in this passage, if we can put it back on the screen, pay attention to whom it is that Matthew invited over for dinner. Who was it that he invited in? It was the tax collectors who were generally looked down in by society. And it was also others that are labeled here as sinners. It raises the question, how, how bad do you have to live your life to be labeled a sinner in Scripture in terms of the label? Not tax collectors get their own line, but this, this category that's just sinners which covers a, a broad amount of backgrounds. I want, I want you to keep in mind also that Jesus at this time is well respected. He's a rabbi. And, and on some level, the type of people that Matthew is inviting to this dinner party or this party in Jesus' honor do not fit the mold of people who gather around and have a reception for a rabbi. So then the question is, why did Matthew invite these individuals to join his dinner with Jesus rather than people of high regard in the community. I think the answer here is pretty simple for us. The reason why Matthew invited this particular group of people is because these are the type of people who were Matthew's friends. They were his family. They were his colleagues at work. These are the people close to him in his life. And so Matthew's example answers that second question. Who do we tell the story to? Uh, we already did it once. We'll show it on the screen again if we can. Who do we share our story with? We start with friends and family because we know them, because we have a connection, because we care and want them to know and meet Jesus. And again, if evangelism is relational, would it not then make sense to start with those with whom you already have a relationship with? Start with those you are closest to. Because the sharing of the gospel is most effective when it comes from someone you know and trust and care about. Or you know cares about you. You can see this in the guest list for Matthew's party or dinner gathering or reception for Jesus. These guests were not the most upright of individuals. Some having 
shady backgrounds, enough to be labeled sinners, and others having a career so disliked that they were, across the board, generally just looked down upon by others. These were not the kind of people that you would expect to gather or keep company with a rabbi. Yet they were Matthew's family, and they were Matthew's friends. And so when he invited them to come and meet Jesus, they came. And what this shows us is it's not for you and it's not for I to decide who will come or who will not come to meet Jesus. Although you might think you know how someone will respond. You'd be like, oh, I, I know that person. They're, they're not going to care. There's no way to truly know. It seems like everyone has had that stubborn family member. If you, if you have this person in your family, you might already be having a name or know who I'm talking about here. That they're opinionated and they're too e eager to share how everyone else is wrong. And when you think about past conversations, the idea of sharing your faith or telling your story with this individual causes more fear or worry than optimism. And then, of course, with that comes that layer of doubt. Would they come to Christ anyways? Except it's not for us, the judge. If God can take someone like Saul, an opponent to the faith, or someone like Matthew there collecting taxes from his own brethren and hanging out with sinners and take them and call them to himself, then who are we to doubt God's power to soften the heart of even the most stubborn people you know? Jesus faced the cross. He conquered sin and even death. And God has called, sent his Holy Spirit to help us to live out this calling. And we know that God is for us and nothing can stand against us. Yet how is it in a society based upon free seats that the church can be so timid about sharing our stories of faith? I want you to think for a moment just how widespread this concern is and the need that is out there to share our faith. Collectively, as a body of Christ, we have this overwhelming task of introducing Jesus to the world. We hear it in the Great Commission. We know, and we've been at it for, for thousands of years, you know, worldwide it is estimated that one in three people identify as Christians. Now that sounds like a really great head start, that one in three. However, after a couple thousands of years of outreach and discipleship, that also means that there is much that is left to be done. And while statistically there is hope, for if one in three people identify with Christ, and, and you hope there's sincerity in that, statistics would say that that means each person just needs to share with two other people. Of course, the issue with this is that the numbers of Christians versus unbelievers is not dispersed equally geographically. But even so, we know that there is much rejoicing in the kingdom of God with each person who comes to faith. And so if we were to take a, a look closer to home at these numbers, we, we see they're telling a little bit different of a story. That according to Pew Research, in the United States, there are around 65% of adults who claim faith in Christ. Now that might sound encouraging compared to the global average, but you have to take a step back and look at the broader picture over a longer period of time. Because it sounds encouraging until we consider that this is a 12% drop in just one decade. In just 10 years, 12% less of adults identify with Christ. And it's a much lower number than the 92% who considered them Christians just 50 years ago. The picture that is painted by these numbers is one where Christianity, where the people of God are losing ground at an increasing rate to the secular culture, 
that surrounds us. And unless believers are committed to the sharing of our faith and praying for the prompting of the Spirit, then sadly this is a trend that all indicators show is going to continue. Unless revival occurs, this is our future. Which means that unless you want to watch the world around you figuratively and in some ways quite literally go to hell, then the calling to reach out is one that we as the people of God cannot be apathetic about. Because if we're going to make a significant difference, if we're going to make an impact for the people of God, then we need to be focused We need to not say things like sharing of the gospel is not my thing. That's for somebody else. Because if we all say that's for somebody else, then who is left to share the good word? Because again, we don't need to be the perfect people. We don't need to have the perfect presentation. All we need is Jesus. And we know God is for us. And he has sent his spirit to help us in these things. So again, we live in a country where, where we have free speech. We don't need to be afraid of persecution by the government for sharing our faith. We're very fortunate. Because there's people all around the planet who don't have that luxury. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who are not so welcomed to share their faith. Some fear the sharing of their faith because they might be turned over to the police because Christianity is banned where they live. Others may face the possibility of being shunned by their family if they express faith in Christ. And so they have to share their faith in covert ways. They have to keep their faith a secret from those close to them until they feel comfortable that they won't be shunned or worse. Yet what often holds us back in in a broad sense from sharing our faith is not a a sense of a fear of death or being disowned or or made an outcast. Because those people that are living that reality are some of the most contagious Christians, are most active in sharing their faith. Usually what holds us back is the fear of an awkward conversation. Because we tend to be afraid of that which we don't know. And since most Christians have not shared their faith on a regular basis, the idea of sharing one's story is something new. It's something different, and therefore it becomes something scary. But there's good news in this. Again, God has sent that Holy Spirit to guide us. That in these endeavors, we're never alone. For we trust not on our strength, not on our ability, but we turn to God in prayer and trust the leading of his spirit. Now, there is actually another reality that you might face in the future, if not already. What if you're to a point in your life, you're saying, well, we're going to start with our friends and family, but I'm looking around and all my friends and family are already faithful followers of Jesus Christ. In some ways, that's a good problem to have. Maybe it means that there's a good amount of discipleship happening in your circle. But I don't think that's a place to stay. A place to stay content, at least. Because I think the answer to this question might be to broaden those circle of relationships. And consider how Jesus responded to the Pharisees when they questioned him about his choice of dinner guests that he was associating with. If we were to continue now, we were moving on to verse 11. We read, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus' response here reflects very well what he did throughout his earthly ministry. He sought out the spiritually sick. He sought out the downtrodden. He sought out those who were cast aside by society. And he had no fear or worry about his image. 
Instead, his eyes was not on the approval of others, but on those that were lost because he cared about them. I think this is the the time where we need to be honest with ourselves. Have you become too comfortable with your circle of relationships? Have you stopped meeting new people? Do you hang out with anyone who's a non-believer? Because when Jesus was throwing a party and invited Jesus, he did not run to the synagogue to find a bunch of righteous individuals to invite to this party. In the same way, you should not only seek the company of those who are already grounded in the faith. Yes, these are good relationships we should have, that we should be discipling and fellowshipping with one another. We should absolutely be spending quality time with other believers. This is an important part of growing and maturing in faith and being the people of God. Yet nowhere in the Gospels, nowhere in all of Scripture, are we today commanded to wall ourselves off from the outside world. In fact, the very opposite is true. That we're commanded to go, to go out and make disciples and to teach them all that Christ had taught his disciples. Consider for a moment the results from a study. Yes, the study is dated. It's from 1984, but I think the information is telling. What this study showed is that in 1984, by that point in time, 97% of the world had heard of a drink named Coca-Cola. 72% of the world had seen a can of Coca-Cola, and 51%, just over half, had tasted Coca-Cola at one time, at least in their life. Considering in 1984, Coke had only been around for 80 years as a beverage. It it makes you on some level wonder if if God had given the task of world evangelism to the Coca-Cola company, maybe we'd be done by now. But in all seriousness, there is no outside source that we can outsource our sharing of faith. We cannot just hire staff to share their faith so we don't have to. And no, Coca-Cola cannot be our evangelism plan. In the same way, we can also not wait idly by for the next Billy Graham or, or the next great evangelists to come and inspire the masses. God has already given each of us what is needed to be equipped for the task that is ahead of us. A task that we are all called to participate in. As the well-known theologian Charles Spurgeon once put it, and yes, he is very pointed in his words, I'll warn you now. He is quoted as saying, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Whoa. One of the things I enjoy about some of the theologians from past generations is they have no issue being very pointed with their words and speaking the unpopular truth. And so the question is, Which are you? Are you a missionary within your circle of influence? When it comes to faith, are you the the real deal? Are you sincere in all aspects of your faith, including being willing to have those conversations of faith? Because my hope is that we can collectively grow in this area of living out our faith. Because it is an important part of spiritual growth. And we all know that there is no shortage of people in this world that need Jesus. I'm sure we all know people that really need Jesus in their life for a variety of reasons. There is no shortage. The need is there. The harvest is at hand. And I believe that God has placed certain people in your life with the intention that you are to share your story with them. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not in a week. But at some point in time, that door will open. Admittedly, for many, this concept of sharing your faith might be new, And it might seem uncomfortable. It might even raise to the level of scary. But in life, it's often those things that make us uncomfortable where we find the most 
growth. And a life of knowing Jesus is not one where we stand still, but it's one in which we continue to grow in faith, especially when we face something that makes us uncomfortable. And so as we consider these things, let us pray for enough faith to face those things that make us uncomfortable. Let us pray. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we thank you for the example we find in Matthew of how he shared about Jesus by inviting those close to him. We ask that you give us the courage to share our faith with those who are close to us. That we too can invite others to know you as we have come to know you. Thank you, Lord, for your work in our lives. Give us wisdom and direction in these matters. Lord, we also think of those who are hard at work on the mission field as they continue God's work of reaching the far reaches of the world. We lift up those missionaries. We support especially Marta Amaro in this time as she has traveled back to the estates and she is preparing next month to come and visit us. And we look forward to hearing about what you're doing in her and Jaime's miss. Lord, thank you for the gentler weather that we've had than was predicted. Although it's been hot, it's not as hot as we thought it would be. We ask that you continue to be generous to us, that you would bring rain for the fields, and that you would cool it down. We ask that you'd bring the temper down even more for those that are planning to go to life light, that they might be able to have that time together, and that people might hear of your goodness and love at that place and time. Lord, as we come to you, we raise up those among us that need healing. We think of those who are healing from surgeries or procedures or other ailments. For, for Julie, she recovered from thyroid surgery, and Karen, as she continues to recover from the heart procedure, and Ray has returned home from his gallbladder surgery. Oh Lord, and Joyce, as she continues to wait for this angiogram, give her patience and peace. And we're grateful that Judy is is able to go home and has received some healing from her procedures to help with the healing of her ribs. We continue to pray for Marvin and Arlene as they focus on several health concerns. For Gary, as he seeks to have more strength in his legs. For Zachary, as he continues his physical therapy in Colorado, Lord. Sometimes in these times of healing, it can drag on. It can be discouraging. So I ask that each of these individuals, you would grant your peace and your patience as they trust in you and wait for you to work in each of their situations. Oh, Heavenly Father, we also raise up to you those who are battling cancer or on maintenance. We think of Scott and Jaime and Pastor Irwin and Randy and Roxanne, and we know there are others. Please be at work in their lives, granting them healing, granting them strength. And please be of encouragement to them and raise up from around them others who would be of encouragement and blessing as they seek to be a helping hand in that struggle, in that fight. Lord, please also be with those who, due to health or ailment, are unable to gather with us on a regular basis, although they would like to. Thank you for the power of the internet, the ability to gather online, live, and later through the local channel or watching later on stream that we can still have a connection together when people are away. Lord, unite us as one, as we are your people. Bring us together as we gather and pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you, if you're willing and able to please rise and sing with us as we praise our Lord through singing song 334, Come ye sinners poor and needy. Yeah.
for a moment. A couple things real fast. Uh, one is our call to action for this series has been to pray for those who don't know Christ in your life. And so you might have noticed this morning on the bottom of the notes there are three lines there. One, a two, and a three. And so our hope and encouragement is that you would take these notes home and write down three names of people that you're going to be praying for, for salvation. These are people who don't know Christ that you have in your life. And ask for opportunity to arrive to share your faith with them. And so, as much as you might love to share your faith with LeBron James, he might not be the person you're most likely to come in contact with. But think, who is it in my relationships that Jesus is calling me to share my faith with? And through prayer and time, those opportunities may arrive. And we will be ready. Another thing to keep in mind is, uh, I didn't find out or I wasn't reminded until after service last Sunday, but we want to recognize that Orville and Ruth last Sunday had a special anniversary of 74 years. And I think that's something to thank God and praise for. So if you find them after service, ask them what the secret is. <laughs> as we continue to praise God, I invite if you'd be willing to stand as we praise Him once again through song. Say 